this morning. We're uh, continuing our series in the book of Mark. And uh, after instructing uh, his disciples on having God's perspective on marriage last week, we talked about marriage, we talked about divorce, and we talked about remarriage. And um, we talked about God's perspective. The disciples were with him and probably wondering what, what's in store next. What are you going to talk about next, Jesus? Well, true to the text, it only makes sense, actually, that after dealing with the subject of God's perspective on marriage, that Jesus would address God's perspective on children. So would you please, please turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, starting to read from verse 13. Mark 10, verse 13. Now we see, after Jesus addressed this subject of divorce and remarriage and uh, God's purpose in marriage, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. Now, I read this, and probably you as well, and you're like, oh, help those guys. You know, how could they rebuke little children when they're coming to see Jesus? Most people here probably have heard the traditional saying that uh, children should be seen and not heard. Maybe you've heard that along the way. It's, it's an old saying, and it's been around for a long time. Victorian era is where this originated with a, an Augustinian clergyman named uh, John Merck. And he uh, made that comment in the year 1450. And it seems as though that's followed the church along through the ages. And rather than participating in discussions, it was thought that it would be best that children would sit in silence listening to and gaining wisdom from the conversations of the adults than to be interacting with them. And although what I just read does not directly refer to uh, particular action, because the children were not speaking in the text here, the Victorian perspective actually re reflects the roots of a more ancient culture as well. The disciples, when they... Um, rebuked these people, they felt that was honestly the right thing to do. Um, despite being taught um, in an earlier example by the Lord Jesus that children were important to him, just prior to this, Jesus had a little one with him, and he was talking to his disciples about children. Culturally, it was enshrined in the conscience of these people um, of the disciples, that um, children were in fact less important than adults. And children um, were actually considered to hold the lowest status in society in the ancient world. Now, the disciples, they, they were on this great adventure with the Messiah. And uh, they knew, and, and he told them that his purpose was to change the world. So before we're too hard on the disciples, uh, when you think about who actually facilitates change in the world, um, children are not particularly in that category, are they? they don't, they're not the ones that come to mind when you think that the world needs a change. Philosophical development, advances in the area of science, technology, or engineering, they do not rest upon the shoulders of children. Greatness and strength, likewise, defending a country from its enemies. They're not childlike qualities that you seek. You're not seeking soldiers that are children. Those are adult qualities. Greatness and strength are not childlike qualities, generally. So with everything Jesus was involved in, he was extremely busy with his ministry activities. And, and Jesus loved to be around the people, and they loved to be around him. There's something about Jesus that was different than anyone they had ever met before. 
and the crowds were pressing in on him on every side. And the disciples, they recognized how Jesus' time was a, at a premium. And um, they, they were no doubt well-meaning in trying to protect Jesus from unnecessary entanglements. Um, you know, we've read in, 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 in chapters prior of how they hardly could get any rest because the crowds pursued them. They ran around the lake. When Jesus went to this side of the lake, the crowd just went around this, this side of the lake to be with him. Everywhere Jesus went, crowds of people were pressing in. So the disciples, they, they, they wanted to save the Lord from unnecessary entanglements. And their, I think their, their purpose might have been good in protecting his time and conserving his strength. They wanted to help organize his schedule so that he could focus on what was really important. And the adult world, where real tangible changes were made by the Messiah, that's where they looked at the value and where the focus of the energy needed to be. It needed to be on the adult community. Children weren't part of that. As a matter of fact, they're kind of a distraction from the Messiah's very busy schedule to bring change into the world. So, but the circumstances at hand that we see here, the people who came to him, they, they didn't know about, or at least they didn't recognize the Lord Jesus' schedule. Like, they didn't recognize how busy he was. All they knew was that the power of God was being revealed through this man, through this Messiah. And they were in awe and wonder of what he was doing. And they recognized that God was working powerfully in and through him. And it was because of this that they brought their little children to him so that he could bless them. And despite the disciples' best intentions to help streamline Jesus' priorities, it didn't mean that they were actually right. As a matter of fact, when we continue reading from verse 14, we find that the opposite is true. They were dead wrong. The disciples weren't in sync with the heart of God on this issue. Reading from verse 14, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So when we think about children for a moment, about their characteristics, we see that in all actuality, they, they have very little control over their lives. Children don't have a lot of control over where they go or what they do. Some, they're, they're under the supervision of other people. They trust what their parents or teachers or other adults say. And, and they do so Oftentimes, without doubts and fear, they learn to trust their uh, teachers. They're not skeptical to the same degree that adults are. Little children haven't been jaded by the hurts this world brings on, and they're more apt to believe in the miraculous possibilities that God would have us see. Most adults don't place their reliance or trust in others, including God, the same way as children do. And this is why Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And Jesus continues in, chap in verse 15 and 16 saying, Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then he took the children up in his arms, placed his hands on them, and bless them. The Lord was trying to emphasize something. He was trying to, to say that we must approach God with childlike faith, but not childish faith, childlike faith. See, there's a huge difference between childishness and childlikeness. Childishness uh, commonly means silly or immature. And this adjective most often points to kind of unfavorable qualities when you think about it, right? So if you're 
kid is acting childishly. It's not necessarily a favorable thing. You, you need to kind of steer that. Childlike, however, means trusting and innocent. And it generally f- refers to the more positive or favorable qualities that a child has. We must come to God with a faith that trusts God, just like a little child who trusts his father, and leave the problems up to our daddy, because it doesn't matter if you're 10 years old, or if you're 95 years old. When you're talking about a relationship with the great I am, who was and who is, and who is to come, who was everlasting to everlasting God, you are but a mere infant in your understanding. See, sometimes people overestimate their knowledge and overestimate their ability to grasp things, but underestimate the fathomless power of the Almighty God and how he set things into motion and how he made things come from the dust of the earth. All of these things are fathomlessly deep and we don't understand it. As sharp as our scientists are, they can't scratch the surface of the knowledge of the Almighty God. So, little children, they trust, they trust what their parents or teachers or other adults say without fear. They're not skeptical to the same degree as adults. They haven't been jaded, right? These qualities. Little children, little children. Did you know that you're a little child before God? You're just an infant. Even if you're walking around with a cane and you've got gray hair. (laughs) When it comes to the great I am, you are a wee grasshopper. (laughs) Jesus emphasized that we must come to God with a faith that trusts him just like a little child who trusts his father and mother, and we must leave all of our problems up to our daddy. Now, when he said this, when Jesus said this, he wasn't saying that all childish behavior displayed by children on a regular basis was humble or innocent. Because like older people, sometimes children's behavior is tainted by the sin nature, isn't it? Your parent, you've raised children, you understand what I'm saying. Children display sinful natures, just like adults. But what Jesus is emphasizing is the fact that, G- that children in character will receive and they don't feel like they have to earn anything that they get because their position is one of dependency, particularly small children. Children are in a place where all they can do, small children, is receive. They don't refuse gifts out of Self-sufficient pride, I can do it my way, I can do it on my own. No, we, we enter God's kingdom by faith, like little children who are dependent on, our, on their father and mother. We're, it's like that. What does a child do when he bangs his head or hurts, scrapes his knee, or there's a hurt or there's a problem? What does a child do? They cry. And they take their problem in a, in a functional family. They take their problem to their mom or their dad. And the Bible is clear that we must receive the kingdom of God with childlike faith, literally like a little child, because there is no way that we can earn our own salvation. And during our, our men's breakfast yesterday, it, it was brought up how we cannot think that we deserve God's mercy. The truth of it is that all people in their natural estate are fallen. We're fallen creatures in our natural state, and we're deserving of the wrath of God upon us. Romans 3.10 is very clear, 10 to 12. The Apostle Paul clearly tells us that all people are alike under the power of sin. It says, as it was written, there is no one righteous 
Not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. It is only because of God's mercy, because of his fathomless grace, that any of us can see salvation. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God nevertheless has given it to us free of charge. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 tell us, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So we're called by Jesus. Called by Jesus to have that same trusting, dependent, childlike faith in God. Adults, we can let our experience of mistrust in this fallen world taint our views on the nature, person, and work of God, and that gives way to both unbelief and cynicism. It's of pivotal importance, my friends, that we don't get the wrong impression of what the Lord Jesus is saying. He's not saying that we do not need to grow up into our salvation and become spiritually mature. He's not saying that. In saying that we must be childlike, he's not referring to the shunning of the depths of Christian learning and maturity of Christian character. God does not desire his children to be immature like a silly, goofy bunch of Peter Pans. <laughs> you ever watched Peter Pan as a kid? Right? Silly, 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 silly. No. That's not God's desire when he's talking about having childlike faith. That's not what he's emphasizing. He desires that we grow up into spiritual maturity as warriors in the faith and pillars of spiritual strength, not in ourselves, but in him. God doesn't want us to stay ignorant and simple-minded concerning his kingdom principles. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brothers and sisters... Stop thinking like children. In regards to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. Furthermore, Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 15, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the people for works of service, so the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Did you hear the power in that scripture? The power? That's God's desire for us, that we become mature in Him, that we grow in Him, that we become healthy in Him. Then we will no longer be infants, verse 14 tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So God makes it abundantly clear he does not wish for us to stay elementary in the faith. That's why 1 Corinthians 13, 11 is says this. When I was a child, Paul says, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put ways of childhood behind me. And the writer of Hebrews identifies contentment with certain believers of abiding in the shallows of Christian understanding. His words are sharp. It's a bit of a rebuke towards those who are content just to drift along. He says in Hebrews 5, 11 to 14, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. 
You see, God wants us to put the ways of childishness behind us. And that's not what Jesus was talking to his disciples about. Jesus wasn't saying, I want you to all be a bunch of immature children for the rest of your Christian lives and just sort of skate on the surface of the depths of the knowledge of the glory of God. No. Jesus' teaching is that unless we receive his kingdom like a little child, with the faith of a little child, we will not, in fact, see it. Having childlike faith doesn't mean that God wants us to be sluggish and taking on adult responsibilities and doing things that we don't want to do. God calls us to grow up in him and to leave childish behaviors behind. For the church to be effective in reaching this generation for the gospel of Christ, it's important for us to take orders from our, from our chief and commander and to take our responsibilities before God seriously. And that is very much adult behavior. I find that I'm drifting along without growing, without consistently giving or serving, I need to stop fantasizing and daydreaming about what it might like to be go, going out and doing things. Running here, running there, and everywhere. I need to stop that. I need to grow up. I need to buckle down, develop maturity in my thinking, and yield to the power of the Spirit who desires to work in and through me for the glory of God. And what I'm saying, don't, don't get me wrong, folks. What I'm saying here is not meant to be a guilt trip. We, we don't earn favor by, from God by, by working. But, but what we do in serving the kingdom of God says much about the state of our hearts before him. And God desires that our heart be rended before him, be humble before him, be teachable before him, be willing to extend ourselves beyond our comfort zone for him. If I'm a servant of God, then my heart will be bent towards service in the church. The church is the body of Christ. And each of us is a part of it. And if I serve with an open heart, you can be sure of one thing, that the Holy Spirit will work in and through me and will use me to encourage and strengthen and build up others around me. And they will grow, and I will grow too. And this is why watching church at home, it's possible to do this on the short term, but in the long term, we're not meant to be islands unto ourselves, even though we can receive great teaching and rich teaching at home when we're watching online services. Watching church at home doesn't hold a candle to being involved in the local church in person. Because God has called you to be part of the body of Christ. You are a part of, part of the body of Christ. Each one of you has a role that God has called you to, to play. And when the body of Christ comes together and when it works together, the Holy Spirit brings health to that, that, that assembly and life into the community. The sad truth is, a lot of North American church culture has fallen into this great consumer mentality trap. And I believe it grieves the heart of God. Many of the Lord's people who possess great potential to glorify God and serving Him to their own detriment and to the detriment of the health of the body of Christ never discover or utilize the spiritual gifts God has given them to use so that He would be glorified. And as a result, approach to Christianity can be very self-focused. And it stunts us and causes us to be immature where God desires us to move on to maturity. It keeps us in the same place where, you know, a Christian that's a Christian for 50 years can still be eating pablum 
and doesn't even know how to share their faith with someone outside of the walls. That's not God's plan. God wants us to grow up into our salvation and to be mature, being filled with the Spirit and, and extending the gifts that he's given to us for his glory and using them and working together with other believers in harmony. And this brings a mighty testimony to a world that's filled with darkness, that can't see their right hand from their left. You are the light of the world. A light on a hill cannot be hidden. Shine your light before men. that They may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The bottom line is, what I'm saying here is, God desires his people not to be content with the shallows, but to pursue mature adult thinking and responsible behavior and to grow up into your salvation, maintaining a childlike faith in God, though, maintaining that heart of innocence and, and awe when it comes to approaching your father, realizing that even if I'm a 95-year-old saint here on the earth, I'm a grasshopper compared to the Almighty. And being in awe of our daddy when we approach him. The fear of the Lord, my friends, is the beginning of wisdom. God's not desiring, even though we live in this country of plenty in North America, doesn't desire for us to be self-focused, stunted, and childish. He wants us to, to shed the consumer mentality towards our Christianity that's become so prevalent because of our society. And get down to serving God. And get down to serving, sacrificially serving each other. That means getting out of your comfort zone, laying it down and saying, God, I don't, I'm, I'm feeling very uncomfortable about this, this is new, but I, I want to give my life to you and have you do what you want in my life and through my life. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. This is beautiful. Our Creator has given us this access to this life, to this power in the spirit that is so refreshing. And it's not of man, it's not of works. It's all by grace. But the Lord who gives us his grace just desires to lavish it upon us. Isn't that great? That we serve a God that longs to lavish his attention on us? Who am I? that the Lord of all the earth should care to know my name, should care to know my worth. Who am I? But yet he does. He knows you, my friend. God is big enough that he knows you. He knows your name and he calls out to you and he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for the Lord has things in store for you. That if you just Walk with him. It's going to blow your mind. It's inconceivable how wonderful it can be to walk with Jesus in the garden that he's given us to walk in. Oh, my friends. The final note in the midst of all this maturity and faith that God desires us to have, we see in their text, God, God desires that we value and we take care of the children that we find in our midst. Children, if you're here today, God has a special place in his heart for you. <laughs> and as his people, he wants us to get over this idea that children should be seen and not heard. Because the little children delight the heart of God. And because they delight the heart of God, they ought to delight our hearts in equal proportion. I know we're not God, but as we become like him, he wants us to delight 
in the hearts of children. Jesus, who actively embodied what it meant to be manly and spiritually mature, he's an, he's an example for us. He took the little children in his arms and he placed his hands on them and he blessed them. In Isaiah 40, 11, it was prophesied that the coming Messiah would behave this way. Isaiah said, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs into his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Just like the early disciples, we buy into the same sort of thinking that children are kind of a nuisance which ultimately get in the way of us being able to do good and productive things in our adult lives, in our adult services, in our adult activities. If the purpose of the church becomes primarily about the serving of the interests of adults, primarily, adopting a philosophy that children should be seen and not heard, and the disciples get annoyed when the children come, the nails are already in the coffin of that assembly. That church will see its influence in their community fade to gray and then disappear. And this is why we must be on guard against being mere consumers of the faith. If productivity and conquering tasks are all, there, all our ultimate objectives of what society tells us is success, then it stands to reason that children are at the bottom of the heap because they are limited in their capacity to serve and contribute to the things that need to be done. See, children have few tangible con contributions to offer in support of the overall efforts of the work of the local church. They make noise. They create tripping hazards. They distract from the enjoyment of some types of programming that adults like. You ever had service where some child just starts howling? Ah! Right? You, know, you understand. Boy, that, can, that gets really under some people's craw. It does, but it shouldn't. That's the sound of life. It's the sound of the blessing. If making disciples is our primary objective, then we need to change our perspective on emphasizing ministry to children. A survey that was conducted by the International Bible Society indicated that 83% of all Christians make their first commitment to Jesus Christ between the ages of 4 and 14. And that is why they are children. That's when they're children, I should say. Early youth or children's. Barna research indicates American children ages 5 to 13 have a 32% probability of accepting Jesus as their Savior. But you 13s aged 14 to 18 only have a 14% probability of doing so. Unbelieving adults aged 19 and, and over have only a 6% pro probability of becoming Christians. Now I know this is all data, but the data shows something true. There is a childlike faith that we need to recognize within younger people that are in our midst, and we need, to, we need to pour into them. The data illustrates the importance of influencing children to make a decision to follow the Lord. Charles Spurgeon. You guys, he's the prince of preachers. So I'm going to read a quote from him. He says this. It's essentially important to bring children to Jesus when we remember that they have a whole life in front of them to serve God with. Will you be very angry if I say that a boy is of more worth than saving a man? It is infinite mercy on God's part to save those who are 70. For what good can they do now with the burnt end of their lives? When we get to 50, to be 50 or 60, we are almost worn out. And if we've spent all our early days with the devil, what remains for God but these dear boys and girls? There is something to be made of them. If now they yield themselves to Christ, they may have a long, happy, and holy day before them. 
in which they may serve God with all of their hearts. Who knows what glory God may have for them? Heathen lands may call them blessed. Whole nations may be enlightened by them. Wow. Following the lead of Jesus. When we recognize that our primary objective is to work with God in making disciples, we recognize that it is of chief importance to to invest in our children and to let the little children come. Guaranteed. If we emphasize discipling our children in partnership with the Holy Spirit, He will lead us and we will in turn see growing, healthy people coming into the church and thriving community. And disciple-making emphasis also cultivates a reproducing culture. And this, in turn, fosters an environment that protects and provides for the new believers that God brings into our churches. Amen. So in conclusion, Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. Forbid them not. Let them come. Today, God might be speaking to your heart. As a church, I want everybody here to listen to this. When you see that parade of children coming forward, they are God's future. And we need to pour into that. And we need to be thankful for each and every child that's here today. Children, if you're listening, you are our primary importance to the Lord. You have a special place in His heart. And He loves you. Give your lives to service of the King of Kings. He'll reveal Himself to you. And you'll see how good He is. This world is filled with turmoil and trouble and brokenness. And the adult world you see around you You see the adults making messes everywhere they go. And, you know, we live in a broken world, kids. But Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong and Jesus loves you. And he desires to use you in his service to be his ambassador, to be his person that he sends into this world that needs so desperately to hear the truth and to see the light. You are God's children and don't ever let anyone look down upon you because you are young. But set an example, knowing what is right to do, do the right things because the Lord walks with you and he'll give you the strength to carry on the mission that he has for the church. You're important. Don't let anyone tell you you're not. Let's bow in prayer today as we close.